Uh, some of you guys are like, wait, before you start, who are you? And that's a fair question. My name is Josh. I'm the new young adults pastor here on staff. And that's where we sit on Sundays. In case you're, if you're welcome to move up if you're a young adult that likes the back. We've got a party in the front. It's happening. Um, and I, I am new on staff. I don't remember how long it's been, but I'll be new on staff until someone else becomes the new guy on staff. So <laughs> buckle up. But I want you guys to get to know me as I dive in because I don't wanna just stand up here and talk. And you guys are like, I don't know you, so I don't trust you. So I figure maybe if I had a nice picture of my family, you would trust me. That is my wife, Melissa. If you've been to the nest, you've probably seen her smiling and saying hi and greeting people. Or she's, she tells stories with the yellow crew uh, so if you have a toddler, she's with them. And then I have Ella Grace, my daughter, my oldest, and then Axel is my son. I won't tell you how old they are because I'll cry because time is a thief and those are my little babies. <laughs> and uh, they get taller every single second. Um, some of you guys have teenagers and you know what I'm talking about. Um, but I do remember before Ella Grace was born, um, Melissa and I went through a childbirth education class because she wanted to have a natural unmedicated birth and we figured we should learn how to do that and we did that and we went and it prepared us for the childbirth, us. It prepared us to go through childbirth together except for like the part where the dad doesn't get waited on hand and foot or there's no coffee and the room's kind of cold <laughs> and all the ladies were booing him from the stage. But. <laughs> It, it was a course designed to get you through the childbirthing process. And then after she was born, we stayed at the hospital. And then the next day I pulled the car around front and there was a police officer from War Fort Worth police who helped check my uh, car seat, make sure it was good. And it was good after he adjusted it and made it good and it was good. And then they put the baby in the car seat and the car seat in the car. And then you peel out of the parking lot going five, six, seven miles an hour. And then you get on the highway and you're cruising up to 20 miles an hour and you get off the highway and the craziest thing happened. We walked into our house and uh, we put the baby down and the diapers down and all the stuff and get mama situated on the couch. Uh, and then, it, then we're there. And there's like a whole child inside of our home now. And like the nurses are gone and the doctor's not there. And they're like, here's the child, good luck. And, and I'm kind of like, now what? Like they didn't teach us this in childbirth education because the childbirth happened. Now the, the birth child is here in my home. We have a whole new life inside of our home. And so that meant like everything changed. I couldn't put my coffee cup on the coffee table anymore. That's too low. And I couldn't sleep when I wanted to sleep. And I couldn't eat when I wanted to eat. And I couldn't listen to music when I would. Like everything changed because there's a whole new life inside of my home. And some of you guys get it, like you've got a roommate that just moved in, or maybe it's an actual child, or maybe you're just going through a new phase of parenting an actual child. Whatever it is, like new things, new lives impact our life. And as we respond to last weekend, which was Easter, we're responding to this new life. And we have to ask ourselves, like now, now what? Like everything is different. So if you were here last week, we talked about that the God is, the good news is God, Jesus is meeting us, the desperate and the doubting. And we, we talked about Mary and we talked about Thomas and Jesus stepping into their lives and offering new life. To say like, no, I'm not dead anymore. I'm alive. He is risen. He's risen indeed. And all of us, because of Jesus, have that invitation for new life. But then after that, after he appeared to them and he appeared on the beach, he's with his disciples and he gets them together and he basically says in Acts chapter one, verse eight, you will receive power when my Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he's telling them this and they're still kind of like, I can't believe he's back, wow. And then right after that, uh, he ascends into heaven. He, he goes up and the apostles are standing there just watching him go up, that's how I picture it. And then he's gone and then two angels walk up to them and they're like, what are you looking at? He's gonna come back the way that he went, but what are you looking at? And then they're gone and then the apostles are like, now, now what? We've gotta to respond to this. And so they all gathered together in a room, in an upper room and it's Pentecost. 
So Passover happened before Jesus died. That's where the last supper was. And then 50 days later is Pentecost. It's a season of feasts because the Jews know how to throw dinner parties really well back then. And so they have these big feasts and everyone's in Jerusalem now. So Jerusalem's a small town. And then they add about 100,000 Jews to Jerusalem from all over the place. And they're all in town for these feasts. But that's when God decides he's gonna send his Holy Spirit on the apostles. Like he said he was going to, he's now doing it. And these guys from Galilee, from Galilee are starting to speak in different languages because these Jews that are around, they're from, uh, they're Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocians, Pontians, Asians, Phrygians, Pamphylians, Egyptians. There are so many different people from so many different places that speak so many different languages. And they're saying like, well, why are these guys speaking my language? They're from Galilee. They don't know how to speak my language. Like these are uneducated fishermen, some of them, and they can't speak my language. And so they know that the only solution, the only answer, like why would they all of a sudden be able to speak my language? Well, they're drunk. That's gotta explain it. Like that's the only reason that I believe. And so Peter realizes they think we're all drunk. And so he stands up and he starts a sermon in a really powerful way. He says, they're not drunk which is a good way to start a sermon. <laughs> Not with that phrase, but answering a question that the people are asking. Like, are they, are they drunk? They must be drunk. Peter says, they're not drunk. And Peter goes on to preach his first sermon. And in the first sermon, he's basically saying, all my Jewish brothers and sisters, you should know that what you saw of Jesus, the man who walked with us and performed miracles and saved lives, and then he was crucified on the cross. You guys crucified him. He, he went into the grave and then he came back. He resurrected and he's alive. And, and some of you guys saw him. He just ascended to heaven and the, he fulfilled the law, all the Jewish law. He fulfilled all the prophecy, all the Jewish prophecy that our forefathers and Five fathers all told us, it's true. Everything that happened, he quoted Joel. It was a beautiful sermon. He said, this, this is legit. And then the last thing that he did is he said his spirit would fall on us. Also, Joel says that, God says that through Joel to his people. And now the Holy Spirit has fallen on us and we're able to speak to you to tell of God's good works and God's good news. And the invitation is for you to come accept this new life. And so he closes out his sermon with let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They heard it and pierced their heart. Like, oh my gosh, this is legit. And I think some of us know that feeling. We know what it's like to hear something, receive something and just be spurred on. Like, ah, I've got to do something. Like this cuts my heart. Have you ever been cut to the heart by the power of the resurrection and how it affects your life day in and day out? Because that's how this movement started. They were cut to the heart. And if we're just, just people who are just celebrating Easter and that was last week, and now we're in a holding pattern until our next big celebration, which is Christmas, which is very far away, parents, so calm down, then it's not the best way to live your life to wait from Easter and go to Christmas and then we just do church in the meantime. No, there's new life available to us. And that should cut us to the heart that we aren't who we used to be that we aren't bound by our sin anymore, that we aren't hopeless people, but we're people that live on the other side of the resurrection where there's new life available. So they said, all right, Peter, if this is legit, this Jesus really is Lord and Christ, like you say, what, what do we do? I've gotta respond, what do I do? And so Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter said a few more things to wrap up his sermon. And then there were added to the number 3,000 that day who repented and were baptized and entered into this new life. Peter's whole sermon was inviting them from where they were, who they were, what they were doing into new life. And he's giving them an invitation to new life, just like God is giving us an invitation into new life through his word. Like, hey, we used, to, we used to have to do all this stuff because of our sin. We had a price to pay 
because we had sinned and we have fallen short and we are broken and we are hopeless. So we have to bring this offering and that sacrifice and that offering, but we don't have to do that anymore because our sin was on his shoulders. The consequence was paid by his death and the power of God was revealed through his resurrection. And now I invite you brothers, let's walk in that new life. This is good. This is exciting. This is different. But so many people were excited. But now that they've repented and were baptized, they, they say, now what? We've gone from the apostles, now what? He's back up there. To the Jewish peoples, now what? All right, if he's legit, everything's changed, now what? And then we're about to see as we dive into Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 47, what did they do? And they didn't realize at the time that they were setting the tone for what it looks like to do church, what it looks like to respond to new life, what it looks like to live a life as a Christ follower. Because they didn't, they didn't have a seminary where they were like, all right, how do we start these programs? They didn't have a pastor who was like, all right, here's the kids ministry and here's outreach and here's this. They just did not respond. So they said, we could start somewhere. And so we're gonna read what they did in Acts 2, 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved." They recognized their new life because Jesus had fulfilled everything they were waiting for. And their response, we're gonna see three responses, three of the ways that I see them responding to new life on this side of the resurrection. And the first thing they did is new lives get together. This isn't some mind blowing theological statement necessarily. They responded by being together because we don't, we don't know what else to do. And as a church, we kind of model that if you guys are looking to check boxes, you're together, great, we're already in the room, we're together. But this wasn't, they weren't starting separate clubs. They weren't just finding like, oh, I'll see you next week, brother, and then they come back. They, they left everything. I came here for this feast with my family and my family's family and my fourth cousins and all the Jews, and now I believe in Jesus and not everyone else is following Jesus, and, but I do, and so now, I'm not alone because I'm together with the 3,000 people who now believe in Jesus. At City Bridge, we say that this is a safe place. We say that because it's true. For one, there are people who come in this door who have stories that aren't quite finished yet. We have people that are still dragging baggage in through the door and it's legit, this is a safe place because we have people from everywhere, every life experience here in this church and this church welcomes that. We wanna to be together in that because we have people who are on the other side of that story that you may be walking in right now. And we have people pointing to Jesus who has given us new life despite my past. And so it's a safe place to be who you are, to be in this place, to go through what you're going through and to be met by others. Verse 44 says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were together, they had all things in common, and I think that meant they knew each other. And to know each other, you have to know who's around, especially with the Lord adding to their number day by day, those who are being saved, you have to know. And one of the things we do here is we have membership process. And Dan talked about it a little bit earlier, like next, next week we have a class where you can learn what it's like to be a member and why we do that. But the big thing is, hey, we wanna be together. And to do that, we need to know who's with us, who's part of that gathering that we are forming with each other. And in our culture, we need each other. If my schedule was up to me, it would center around me. But you saw my family picture. <laughs> I can't center around me anymore because of the new life in my life. But even still, I could still build my schedule around we, we go around, we do different things, but it's all on my time, my schedule, my preferences. And I could justify like, yeah, we were together. 
As an American church, I, I heard a pastor summarize it really well that we are experience rich, but relationally poor. So we're around people all the time. I take my kids to soccer and t-ball and jujitsu. I'm around people all the time. And the whole time I'm there, I'm cheering them on every time I look up from my phone, but I'd much rather not talk to the people around me, which is weird because there are parents in this room who are on the soccer team with my girl. But that's the way I'm wired, to be a loner. It's like, give me my, like I'm, I'm always around people. I never get me time. But the reality is my new life has been changed by Jesus and there are other people who have no idea what that means. And so what if I'm around other people who have been changed by Jesus and I could be encouraged by their story? I could be spurred on by their story. I could be changed even further by their story if I would loosen up my schedule a little bit and instead of just being around each other, I would get together because I have a new life. I'm kind of jealous because I don't live in Allen and west of 75. I still might sneak into the potluck next week. But as a church, we're setting up a time where, hey, what if we were together? What I love about those regional gatherings, it's, it's really close to what they were doing in Acts 2. Well, what's on the agenda? Well, people are gonna bring food and we're gonna sit together and eat the food and talk to the people we're around eating food. Like, that's my kind of agenda. Like, who, who can't get behind that? If you wanna sneak in with me, you're welcome to. Just bring a dish to share. But that's one example. My new life has caused me to be around other people whose lives have been changed so that we could encourage each other, so that we could be known and we could have a safe place with each other and I could share my burdens and my baggage with them and they can pray and petition the Father on my behalf. In verse 42, and that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Once we're together, we can recognize with awe and wonder of God working through our lives. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. God's word teaches us how to be together time and time again, place and place. You read through the New Testament about how believers were together. You can read about some of the fights they had and how God would ask them to resolve those conflicts. You can read about how they were good at something and God multiplied it and said, do more of that. You can read about the joys and the pitfalls because it instructs us on how we can be together. And that's just one thing a new life in Christ does. I think the next thing as new lives in Christ, we get to worship. And some of you guys are already thinking like, all right, I'm already together and I'm already in worship. I'm nailing this sermon. Great test, pastor. But if we're gonna get to worship, obviously this is one place. Sundays are a great place for us to come together and worship. And I'd say we should, we should be here worshiping together at 11-ish, depending on when you walked in the room. But I, I have two kids and there are Sundays, like I work here, so I, I need to be here early, but still I gotta get my kids back to their classrooms and we're rolling in. And by the time I get down to my seat, it could be 11.05, 11.15-ish, and my, my heart is not like in a place at all. Like I'm, I'm jittery, I'm frustrated, I'm stressed. Like I can't believe the guy from the first service pulled out of the parking lot like that. And I'm just, I'm stirred in the wrong ways. Because worship has not always been a priority for me. But if I have a new life in Jesus, I should celebrate that new life in Jesus and celebrate the one who gave me that new life. And that happens through worship. David Gentiles is our worship pastor. He was standing here, right here, this morning, leading us in worship. And he also teaches really well on worship. And what he teaches us is that worship should cause us to, to experience awe. Just like in verse 43, it says, and awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And David makes awe an acronym, A-W-E, adoration, wonder, and expectation. So adoration, I worship because I adore God. He's given me a new life. I didn't deserve it. I adore God because he's, he's taken things that were dead and he's brought them to life. He's taken things that used to define me and changed the definition of who I am. I'm a child of God. I was once an orphan and now I am his child. 
I was experiencing shame, but now he's given me his glory and his righteousness. And then wonder, like there's nothing that our God can't do. I, I sing that phrase with wonder because I've, I've seen the things that he can do. And there's nothing that he can't do. I've been in the situations where it's like, this is too heavy to carry. And I'm white knuckling it, but I'm not, I'm not getting there. And then I release it and God just overwhelms me with his provision, with his grace. So worship draws us to adoration and wonder and then expectation. Do we still believe that God is a God that's doing big things? I sing songs about them, but do I believe them? Do they cut me to my heart? Because I expect that he's gonna continue to do big things. He, he can take bones and have them stand up and make armies. He's the only one who could do this. He could take people who are experiencing grief and mourning and loss and cause them to dance. And those may be extremes, but he can and he will keep doing that in your story, in my story, in the story of the person next to you. And so when we're drawn to worship here in this place, it should come from a place of awe. Intrinsically, we are wired for awe, with awe. There's, there's probably a 20 year season of my life where I was in awe of the Texas Rangers. And I would build my life around that anticipation. This is the year and 19 years of my awe being crushed and misplaced. You could also put it around my other Dallas team that I love, whose year is coming. But then last October, I was in awe. We kept going on the road where you're supposed to lose and we kept winning and winning and winning and winning and winning. And then finally, these little Rangers won the World Series. They are presently the world champions, the best team in the entire world. I don't know if David Gentile is gonna hear that, but. But I'm drawn in awe of that. And that happened in October and then Thanksgiving happened and Christmas happened and, and I, it kind of lost its wonder because it's not gonna satisfy me. Even though they're gonna win it again this year, I'm still not gonna be drawn into wonder. Like how do they keep doing this? Cause they're gonna let me down and they're gonna lose games and they're gonna lose players. They're gonna make poor choices, but we're drawn to awe. We're drawn to, there's gonna be a new iPhone coming out in September, probably it happens every year. It's gonna be a new MacBook that comes out right before Christmas. They're gonna upgrade the new Kia, whatever, or Dodge Ford, whatever you drive. And you're gonna want it. Like I'm in awe of these things, I want them. Cause that's how we're, why we're drawn to worship. But we direct that worship at things. And I think our response to a new life, something that should fill me with awe. In Ephesians 2, it says that we were once dead in our trespasses. Cause that was me. And. And being dead in my trespasses made me feel hopeless. Like, I can't get out of this. But maybe if I try harder. And so I'd try harder. God, I wanna stop doing that. I wanna stop treating people that way. I wanna stop speaking like that. I wanna stop coping like that. All different parts of my story. God, maybe if I tried this, if I tried this, if I tried this, if I tried this. I was dead and hopeless and lost and out but God made us alive by his grace, not by anything I could do so that no one would boast, only by something that he could do because my white knuckles couldn't do it. And so I'm in awe of the new life that I have in Jesus. And that's worth celebrating in worship. I can only imagine what Jerusalem looked like when 3000 Jews made the choice to accept the invitation in a new life because that was not an easy choice probably for some of them. And it had a ripple effect. And so it caused them to worship at God's provision. In Romans chapter 12, verse one, Paul writes, I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This act of worship shows us the other side. New lives get to worship in, in worship, but also in service. So serving people is an act of worship. Living a life beyond yourself is an act of worship. And we have people in this church right now who are serving, not because they just find great joy in helping people out, but because Jesus gave them a new life and they wanna do what they can to make others aware of that new life. And so they're, they're rocking babies, 
They're hanging out with junior high students, which is an act of service to the church. They're running the tech arts team. We have people that go, they choose to go into prison to share the gospel with prisoners. They make that choice to leave the freedom of this world and go into prison to share with these literal prisoners about this new life available to them, even in their captivity through our prison ministry. We have people who just wanna be great neighbors and they say, I'm gonna intentionally be a good neighbor as my act of worship and I'm gonna serve in that way. Serving allows us to empty our lives just like Jesus did when he left the throne and came to earth. He didn't come as a God, as a king, he came as a man who humbly served others, who included people who shouldn't have been included by the world's standards and he added value to people who had no value by the world's standards. So when we empty ourselves, it's an act of worship. Like I'm in awe of the fact that I get to do this. Last week, I got to hang out with 17, 18 month olds in our orange room. And there were moments, but then there were other moments where like, oh my gosh, if there are 17 of these in here, then I can only imagine the tired, weary parents who are actually getting to go and be in worship. So I'm gonna serve the heck out of these kids. If it's 17, great. If it's 34, send help, but still great. <laughs> because they know if they're in there praying over your kids, sharing the gospel with your kids, you get to be in here engaging around God's word, engaging in song, and that's a blessing. And then the last thing we see them do is that new lives get to work. While City Bridge is a safe place, we say that there's a high call in that safe place and getting to work is that high call. There is work to be done. Paul writes in Philippians 2, continue to work out your salvation. I wanna be clear, this is not working to be saved. This is not working to earn anything. This isn't working in a way that's gonna get you a new crown or upgraded countertops in your mansion in heaven. That's not the work we're engaging in. The work we see them doing is here in verse 45. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. I love the quote that says, grace is not opposed to working, it's opposed to earning. The work that we have to do is the work of an evangelist and we see the work of the evangelist being played out. They did the hard thing. They, they took things that were theirs and sold them so that everyone could have basic needs. People that had plenty gave freely. They got to work in opening the space a little bit more because 3,000 people in Jerusalem who aren't there for all the other reasons everyone else is there, you need to have space. And they did what they could to open up the space. And so the work of the evangelist is the calling of the people who have a new life in Jesus Christ. When, when we got a new life in our home, you didn't have to guess. Our neighbors could hear in the middle of the night Someone was screaming, there was a new life in my home. When I'd take the trash out, you would see the long tube from the diaper genie. You didn't have to guess. If you saw me in public, you would ask a question like, well, do you have a picture of the baby? What a silly question. I have probably 14 gig of pictures <laughs> still several years later of that baby. My new life was not a guess for anyone and I was willing to tell everyone about it. The work of the evangelist is a scary thing for people. If I say, I need you to go share your faith with others, some of you are like, well, that's really not my gift. I have the gift of prayer. <laughs> so I will pray for you as you do that. Because I don't, it makes me uncomfortable and God didn't call me to be uncomfortable. I'd be careful throwing that phrase around. But the work of the evangelist is, is the work that we have ahead of us because our new life has changed. People should wonder why and we should be willing to talk about it, why? And what's cool is 
if I were to walk up on this stage with my big white and red bag that says Cane's on it and tell you guys, this is the best chicken around, there'd be an uprising, right? A pastor didn't say Chick-fil-A's, the best chicken around. If I go up to the Little League field and I see like, oh, I see you're eating golden chick. Well, have you tried Cane's? It's a far superior tender. No, don't get started on the sauce. Well, anyway, good luck with your subpar chicken. And I'm willing to talk to anyone I see with chicken about their chicken choices. And I think we as a people are willing to talk chicken with people. You can replace chicken with sports, with movies, with TV, whatever, but the chicken, it's like, yeah, we're gonna talk about this. And then that's kind of where it ends. And you're willing to approach someone about their food choice, but you're not called to tell them about the new life you have in Jesus Christ. Well, what if, what if that makes them uncomfortable? Well, you just bash their meal. They just spent 14, what if that made them uncomfortable? What if they don't like me afterward? You're talking about the difference of death and life. I hope they like you. When you're at work preaching the word, the good news that will save their life, the chicken they choose is not a life and death situation, even though you might think that. The work of the evangelist is leaning in. Start with the chicken. Hey, I see you chose Cain's. Good on you. I'm Josh. What's new in your life? Great. Oh, that's hard. What do you, what do, you do when things are difficult? I've been there before. Do you guys, do you have a faith? Do you have something that helps you believe, helps you move on in that? And then maybe they're like, yeah, I'm a Christian because I was raised in a Christian household. Not, well, did you know God's still available to you right now in that hardship? I'd love to, I'd love to help you meet with him, to chat with you. Hey, could I pray for that hardship for you? Or, wow, your faith is encouraging my faith. I'm in awe to worship God because of the story you just told me about his provision. Because maybe before that bag of chicken, they didn't have any money for any chicken. It's like, wow. Do you wanna come to church with me? I'm around a group of people that wanna make sure that you don't go without chicken again. And that's good news. Me and my neighbor, I won't say his name, because I forgot to ask, but he's Kyle's son-in-law. And he said, what if we started a fantasy football league for the guys in the neighborhood and their wives? And at first I was like, sounds like a lot of work, but if you're willing, I'm in. And he was willing, so I was in. And the purpose was not to show all the other guys in the neighborhood how good I was at fantasy football, because I finished middle of the pack even, not even that good. But now all of a sudden I've got these neighbors that I didn't know before, who I'm texting about their life and the football season's far gone. And I'm texting about hard times. Oh man, that's, that's difficult. I've, I've gone through seasons where my kids have been sick for 90 days and I know how hard that, can I bring y'all dinner? Can I pray for you? And then I can text again and text again. Then I can see them out in the neighborhood and I can lean in and do the work of an evangelist because I have new life. And I know it's easy to feel despair when you have a baby at home, when you lost your job, when you're going through conflict in your marriage, when you're stuck in an addiction and you just can't get out. I've been there. Can I offer you some help and a way out through a new life? Getting to work is telling people the good news that they have new life available. And then the last thing is the generosity. These people began selling the things that they had. Selling. That meant this second house that I have is no longer my second house. This first house that I have is no longer my first house. That couch, not my couch, I sold it because I saw hungry people in my church and I wanted to feed the hungry people in my church. And some of you are like, I don't have a, a second house to sell or a first house to sell. But there's still hungry people in our church. There's still people with need within the body who, who have new life and they're relying on the body of Christ to, to come around them, the church to be the church. And so for some of you, I'm, I'm not saying you gotta sell your second house, maybe. But what if I didn't go out for coffee as often? That $4 a week I'm saving, $8, 15, depending on your drink, really compounds. 
What if I didn't take the easy way out every evening and go through the drive-thru to make dinner for my family? And all of a sudden, that bag of chicken that I bought that'll feed my kids for two weeks, I've saved $20, $30. What if I was able to tell my kids like, hey, what if we took this money that we saved and we gave it to someone who doesn't have any? There's families that have never been to Chick-fil-A. What if, what if we got to take them? Or Billy's dad lost his job and they need a little help. What if, what if we sold this? And what if we didn't go out to eat? And what if Tongue and Cheek could wait one more week and we were able to help them out? Time and time again, I've, I've been encouraged. I've been a pastor on staff. This is my third church. That's not my addiction, but I do <laughs> love it. I've been on staff at two other churches that were great. And they, they were great at modeling this well. But when it came time for me and my wife to choose where we wanna to go to church when I wasn't a pastor anymore, it was wild. We chose this place and it didn't take long at all for us to realize that City Bridge gets it as a church. It's like, I've seen this done well, but at City Bridge it's done really well. They're willing to lean in and say words from the stage that other churches would not say because those words don't define them anymore. The first stage I heard the phrase porn addiction was this stage. The first time I saw someone who cheated on his wife was on this stage and they weren't shouting about those things. They were shouting about Jesus stepped into my story and I have a new life. That's not my marriage anymore. That's not my vice anymore. I've been set free. The number of community groups I've heard of where it's like, well, after the fact, we hear of community groups where, hey, we know there's a single mom who's struggling financially. Can we pay her rent for the next three months? We know there's kids who need to go to city limits who can't afford it. Can you just tell me how many kids need to go and I'll write a check right now. This church does that time and time again, but this isn't just doing church well. This is because we have people in this church who have been changed from death to life because of Jesus and the new life that he has. I can confidently say, if you were a member here at City Bridge, you will not go without food, clothing, or shelter ever. That's why we value membership because we wanna know who's with us and who needs help. And so if you're a member here, you're never gonna go without, not because we wanna be the church that provides, but because Jesus provided for us in a powerful way. And so one of the last things that he did with his disciples at that Passover meal, is he said, I want you guys to never forget what I'm about to do. So he took the bread and at Passover, whoever's leading the meal is supposed to hold the bread up and say, this is the bread of our affliction of our forefathers to remember. But instead Jesus holds up the bread and he breaks it. And he says, this bread is my body broken for you. And so here, take and eat some bread and remember my body broken for you. And this cup is the blood of the new covenant given and shed for all. So it's my blood. And so when you drink this blood, do this in remembrance of me. And so I'd encourage you, we're gonna close out with a time of communion. And if you've accepted the invitation in a new life in Jesus, the invitation is to remember Jesus through his broken body and his shed blood. Not because it'll fill us up, because it won't, but because he gave his entire life so that we could have our lives eternally. And maybe you haven't accepted the invitation to new life. You don't know what it looks like to know Jesus, walk with Jesus, be a part of the new life. I would encourage you during communion to reflect. We have, we have prayer partners who will be in that corner and that corner who would love to pray with you or answer any questions about what does this look like? Or after the service down front, we're gonna have people who just wanna pray with you and not accost you and welcome you. And so we're gonna have the band lead us in a time of worship as we're together preparing to do the work together. I'd invite you to partake in the good news of the new life of Jesus. We have communion tables around the side walls and up front, go to one that has elements for you. During the song at any point, feel free to take the bread and eat, take the drink and drink and remember Jesus gave his life so that you could have yours. Let's pray together, church. God, thank you so much for the new life that we get because of your son, Jesus. Thank you for giving all so that we might have. Thank you for setting a model so we might follow. Thank you for helping us to see you so we might know you more. Would you bless this time as we remember you and help us to
to really model well what it looks like to celebrate the new life that you give us through your son. And it's in his powerful name we pray, amen.